But there's also the fact that Hannah's prayer now was most likely different. And it was the right prayer at the right time to be delightfully answered by the Lord. Yet it was not because of, it was not because now he was finally convinced that he could answer her prayer, but he gave her the heart to finally ask for it properly. Dr. R.C. Sproul has mentioned, as we saw in last Wednesday's video, that our prayers do not change or redirect the will of God. His will has been established from the beginning of time, but our prayers do change us. And while the Lord heard every prayer that Hannah had made for all these years regarding her barrenness, he chose instead to slowly change her, to slowly bring her to a point through reproach and through the love of her husband where she would begin her prayer or she would ask this prayer with a heart truly ready for this blessing. I can imagine the pain and sorrow of Hannah throughout all those years, especially early in her marriage to Elkanah, and how it must have felt to pray and then to be torn to shreds by Panina's words year after year as this barrenness continued to afflict her until a time where her heart would be in such a place where she could make a vow and be so thankful for God's faithfulness that she would follow through with that vow and give the glory to God. And this prayer that we read last week changes Hannah, as we saw in these verses, but in a much different way than before. Whereas her unanswered prayers before changed her in a way that, that humbled her and brought her low, as we read here, she now no longer struggles to eat and her face is no longer sad, but now she has joy and thankfulness in her heart because of this prayer. It's an unbelievably exciting and faith-affirming moment when we can see our prayers being answered and that process unfolding before our eyes. But we should not let that be the motivation for our prayer. It wasn't until the Lord brought Hannah to a place where her answered prayer meant glory for himself that he granted her petition. We must always trust the will of God, whether our prayers are answered or not. We know that he does hear the prayers of his children, but we must also know that it is a privilege to pray. It is not a right. Just the knowledge that our prayer is heard by an infinite God should be enough to satisfy our hearts. For if he who knows all things and created all things could hear our petition, and even if he doesn't answer it, then obviously that's what's best. He knows all things. But we can also rest in knowing that he will use our prayers to prepare us for his answer when he deems that he should answer it. And it's all to prepare us for his glory and to offer him his glory. Hannah's preparation for this answered prayer was grueling. All these years of torment and struggle that she had gone through, but it was well worth it, as her child would not only be the first of many that she eventually had, um, but he would propel the history of redemption in a direction that had directly led to the Savior, not only for the Jewish people, but of the entire world. Let us look more deeply at this kind of amazing story of fulfillment here that we get at the end of chapter one. We're finally introduced to Eli, who is the current judge of Israel at this moment. Um, while he doesn't necessarily bear that title um, in the text, we can assume that he is part of the continuation of the judges, although he assumes a, a priestly role of leadership where many of the other judges were um, also assumed a very military um, role. Um, we know that from the final era of Judges, in the book of Judges, that this role had taken a real nosedive. Uh, both in moral integrity and in faithfulness to the Lord, the Judges were insufficient for keeping Israel safe from their own sinful ways. And Eli, as we can see here, is proving to be no different. Um, we get a glimpse here of Eli's poor judgment in verses 12 through 16. This man is serving in an office in which uh, he was a religious leader in charge of worship at the tabernacle, the most holy of places in Israel, 
and he sees a godly woman in heartfelt prayer, and he cannot discern that from drunkenness. We will learn more of his incompetence later on, especially in chapter 2, but for now, we see him making very poor judgment upon this woman whom the Lord has brought to her knees. Now, drunkenness at the temple was a major issue at the time, um, and it was a major disgrace to uh, worship at the temple in drunkenness, and it would lead to great judgment if you were caught doing it, um, especially if you were a priest and you were caught uh, drunk at the temple, you could be put to death for that. Um, so Eli's charge here that this woman is drunk uh, before the tabernacle is a very serious charge. It's not something that is just taken lightly. He's not just trying to shoo her away, but he's potentially casting very serious judgment upon her. Now, the even sadder reality at this point in Israel's his history is that a drunken person showing up to the tabernacle probably was a relatively common enough occurrence, at least enough to give Eli a suspicion that that's what this woman was doing. We must not forget that Israel is in absolute chaos in these days. It's not there's not very many faithful people. Hannah, however, as we know, is not drunk, and she pleads her case before Eli. She corrects him, telling him not to regard her as a worthless woman, or as the Hebrew literally means, a daughter of Belial. We will find those exact words used later to describe Eli's sons. But Hannah is not like that, and Eli, of all people, should know this. On the contrary, Hannah, Hannah has been casting everything before the Lord, pouring out her troubled soul in a humble prayer. In verse 17, we get Eli's benediction upon Hannah. Upon understanding and the revelation that this woman is not drunk, uh, he speaks to her as he probably should have to begin with if he were competent. He asserts that her prayer would be answered. He endorses her petition, which at the time an endorsement by the priest of the tabernacle was, was viewed as a blessed affirmation. Eli's incompetence in his leadership still does not void the fact that he was placed in his position by the Lord and had come to the prop, of the proper lineage to be in the position that he's in, and he is able to give such an affirmation. And ironically, though, at this moment, and unknown to Eli, him granting her petition would be his ultimate demise for the child that she will bear would be the next leader of Israel, the one who would come after Eli. But upon receiving these words from Eli, Hannah becomes a different person than we have been reading about in the previous verses. She is no longer weeping. She's no longer sad, no longer refusing to eat, but she's lighter now having shed the weight of her anxieties upon the Lord, knowing that he does indeed care about her. Verses 19 through 20 are the climax of this chapter. Hannah finally conceives. We are told prior to leaving Shiloh that they wake up early and they worship before the Lord. And I can only imagine that Hannah's disposition in her worship this morning is much different than it was before. I wonder if, if she had told Elkanah um, after she had prayed and after Eli had given her his benediction. I wonder if Elkanah is aware at this moment as they worship before the Lord this morning. But even if not, I can still imagine her excitement at least at this time. The thankfulness and the gratitude probably saturating her worship. What a beautiful moment it must have been and probably a very new experience for Hannah after all these years. We then are told that Hannah's prayer has been answered and the Lord remembered her. Thinking back to Hannah's prayer in verse 11, uh, you will recall that she prayed for the Lord to remember her, not to forget her, before she asked specifically for the child. And here she is remembered. The child she names Samuel. For she says, I have asked for him from the Lord. Many debate the actual meaning of the name Samuel, but it all comes to nearly the same. Hannah asked for this son, and the Lord answered. 
She has so designed it that when his name is spoken, it should invoke remembrance of God's favor toward her, just as it was his remembrance of her that made it happen. Verses 21 through 23 show us Hannah's commitment to her vow and Elkanah's faithfulness to a vow that he made as well. As I mentioned earlier, women were not required to attend the yearly feasts. And although Hannah had made it a point to attend in years past, this time she chooses to remain at home, weaning her child. Um, there are two purposes for her doing this. One, she was dedicated to raising this child. Because he was dear to her, of course, but also because he was devoted to the Lord. So she would be extra diligent in her care for him and ensure that she would be the only one to prepare him for this distinct role. Second, she would not take this boy to Shiloh until he was ready to be left there. For when Hannah would eventually bring Samuel to the tabernacle, he would not be returning with her. If he were to be properly ready to begin his services to the Lord, he needed to be weaned and to be somewhat self-sufficient. Elkanah gives his full support, as we're explained here in these verses. We are also told that he makes the trip to Shiloh to pay his vow. And while we aren't told exactly what that vow was, many believe it can be assumed that Elkanah had also at one point uttered a vow to the Lord in his prayers for a son. And so as Hannah is faithful, so is Elkanah. And he makes it a point to make the trip. He says to her in his response for her not coming, only may the Lord establish his word. And there was no explicit word of God in these days. In fact, it was actually his son who would come later on that would be the first prophet to come to Israel in a very long time, hundreds of years. But Elkanah's remark could be more seen through the lens of God's entire covenant purposes. That he in fact is saying, may the Lord bring his promises to fulfillment through this blessed child. And knowing the vow Hannah had made, he found that what she was doing was right in the sight of the Lord. Finally, in verses 24 through 28, Hannah fulfills her vow. Hannah has weaned Samuel, and it is now time for him to be given over to the Lord. After he is weaned, she takes the next opportunity to go to Shiloh, and she brings with her a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour, and a skin of wine. This is specific because it is in accordance with um, what we read in Numbers chapter 15, where fulfillment of a vow was to be sealed with a young bull, an offering of a young bull, fine flour, and wine. So Hannah is not only adhering to this in her faithfulness to the Lord, but also does so in greater measure than what is asked and what is required. She comes again to the priest Eli, bringing her son with her, and she reminds Eli of who she is and what she had been praying for that day. Now, the language used here is very interesting in the original Hebrew. Um, we saw a few verses earlier, Hannah's naming of Samuel was because she had asked of him or asked for him of the Lord. Well, in this short proclamation from Hannah to Eli, she uses the Hebrew term for the word ask four times. Well, it's actually... Um, uses different forms of the Hebrew for word asked or ask four times. Despite the discrepancies on what the name Samuel actually means, it is absolutely certain that Hannah's intention is to declare that he was asked for and that the Lord had given him. But not so, not so coincidentally, the last form of the word ask in Hebrew used here is identical to the name of another man, another prominent man in this story who we have not been introduced to yet, whose name is Saul, whose name directly means asked for. Only we will come to find that Saul was asked for in a much different manner, and God's answer would mean much different things for Israel than his answer to Hannah's asking. God chose Hannah by his sovereign will. And in that will, he proved a very important lesson for her and us by extension. Prayer is real. 
It is not a formality. It is not a negotiation tactic. We are commanded to pray. Not so that God can have our requests ordered or be able to make a list of our wants and needs so he can decide what to give and what not to give, but because he is the source for all of our fulfillment. There is an aspect of dependence that must be attached to our, to our prayers, where the sense is that we are bringing this before the Lord because who else could we bring it to? If God is sovereign, how else can the world be ordered to accomplish anything by his design? You can't even drive to work safely without it being according to his will. He has afforded us the honor to come before him for our desires, that his glory and his power and his grace and his mercy may shine. If things just happened in the absence of prayer all the time, what cause would we have to believe that it truly was of God? What cause would we have to believe that he loves us and cares for us if he didn't work through our petitions and grant us that privilege? If not for God's remembering of Hannah after her prayer, would she have truly known that it was the Lord who cared for her to give her that? But she knows now. Because not only did God give her what she desired most, but he offered her no doubt that it was him who gave it to her and him alone by answering her petition through prayer. Make no mistake about it, 1 Samuel chapter 1 is not about Hannah, it is not about Elkanah, or even Samuel. It is mainly about God. It shows us his care for those who are faithful in their affliction, it shows us how he cares for those who are unfaithful, but living under his covenant promise. As this child would be a pivotal player in establishing the monarchy, the cure for Israel's leadership crisis. Samuel's miraculous birth is the demonstration of God's care for his people. And in another thousand years or so, Samuel would be surpassed by another son born of miraculous circumstances who would demonstrate God's care for his people for all time and throughout all the world in Jesus Christ. He would be the fullest expression of God's love for his people, the fullest expression of answered prayers, the fullest expression of taking away our anxieties, and the fullest expression of service to the Father. The one who not only brings the kingdom to fulfillment, but perfects it for those who believe. Let's pray. Father God, how amazing you are, how graceful you are to give us a way to communicate to you our petitions, to not only grant them, Lord, but to give us the heart to do so in a way that will glorify you, which means fulfillment for us, which means purpose for our lives. Lord, I pray that our intentionality with our prayers today is even greater, Lord, after seeing what you have done through the life of Hannah um, and her husband, Elkanah, Lord, to bring um, such, a, such a major pivotal moment in redemption history to Israel. Lord, I just thank you for the opportunity um, to, to examine your word, Lord, to learn from it, to grow from it. Lord, I pray that we just have a prayerful heart today, and that our prayers would be lifted up to you, not so that we could get what we want, Lord, but that we may give to you everything and may continue to glorify you in everything we do. We love you. We thank you. It's in Christ we pray. Amen.